Launch Complex 39 (LC-39) is a rocket launch site at the John F. Kennedy Space Center on Merritt Island in Florida, United States. The site and its collection of facilities were originally built for the Apollo program and later modified for the Space Shuttle program. Launch Complex 39 is composed of three launch pads. 39A, 39B and 39C, a vehicle assembly building VAB, a crawlerway used by crawler transporters to carry mobile launcher platforms between the VAB and the pads, orbiter processing facility buildings, a launch control center which contains the firing rooms, a news facility famous for the iconic countdown clock seen in television coverage and photos, and various logistical and operational support buildings. As of 2017, only launch pad 39A is active and has been used to launch SpaceX's Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Pad 39B is being modified to launch NASA's Space Launch System. A new, smaller pad, 39C was added in 2015 to support smaller launches, but has not yet been used. SpaceX leases launch pad 39A from NASA and has modified the pad to support Falcon Heavy launches in 2017 and beyond. NASA began modifying launch pad 39B in 2007 to accommodate the now defunct Project Constellation, and is currently preparing it for the Space Launch System with the first launch scheduled for December 2019. Pad C was originally planned for Apollo but never built, and would have been a copy of pads 39A and 39B. A smaller pad designated 39C was constructed from January to June 2015 to accommodate small class vehicles. NASA launches from LC 39A and 39B have been supervised from the NASA Launch Control Center, LCC, located 3 miles kilometers from the launch pads. LC 39 is one of several launch sites that share radar and tracking services of the Eastern Test Range. Topic History Topic Early History Northern Merritt Island was first developed around 1890 when a few wealthy Harvard University graduates purchased 18,000 acres 73 square kilometers and constructed a three-story mahogany clubhouse, very nearly on the site of Pad 39A. During the 1920s, Peter E. Studebaker, Jr., son of the automobile magnate, built a small casino at De Soto Beach 8 miles 13 kilometers north of the Canaveral Lighthouse. In 1948, the Navy transferred the former Banana River Naval Air Station located south of Cape Canaveral, to the Air Force for use in testing captured German V-2 rockets. The site's location on the East Florida coast was ideal for this purpose in that launches would be over the ocean, away from populated areas. This site became the Joint Long Range Proving Ground in 1949 and was renamed Patrick Air Force Base in 1950. The Air Force annexed part of Cape Canaveral to the north in 1951, forming the Air Force Missile Test Center, the future Cape Canaveral Air Force Station CCAFS. Missile and rocketry testing and development would take place here through the 1950s. After the creation of NASA in 1958, the CCAFS launch pads were used for NASA's civilian unmanned and manned launches, including those of Project Mercury and Project Gemini. Topic: <laughs> Apollo and Skylab. In 1961, President Kennedy proposed to Congress the goal of landing a man on the Moon by the end of the decade. Congressional approval led to the launch of the Apollo program, which required a massive expansion of NASA operations, including an expansion of launch operations from the Cape to adjacent Merritt Island to the north and west. NASA began acquisition of land in 1962, taking title to 131 square miles 340 square kilometers by outright purchase and negotiating with the state of Florida for an additional 87 square miles 230 square kilometers. On July 1, 1962, the site was named the Launch Operations Center. Topic: <laughs> Initial design at the time, the highest numbered launch pad on CCAFS was Launch Complex 37. When the Lunar Launch Complex was designed, it was designated as Launch Complex 39. 
It was designed to handle launches of the Saturn V rocket, the largest, most powerful rocket then designed, which would propel Apollo spacecraft to the Moon. Initial plans included four pads five were considered evenly spaced 8,700 feet 2, meters apart to avoid damage in the event of an explosion on the pad. Three were scheduled for construction AC, to the southeast and two D &E, west and north would have been built at a later date. The numbering of the pads at the time was from north to south, with the northernmost being 39A, and the southernmost being 39C. Pad 39A was never built, and 39C became 39A in 1963. With today's numbering, 39C would have been north of 39B, and 39D would have been due west of 39C. Pad 39E would have been due north of the mid-distance between 39C and 39D, with 39E forming the top of a triangle, and equidistant from 39C and 39D. The crawlerway was built with the additional pads in mind. This is the reason the crawlerway turns as it heads to pad B, continuing straight from that turn would have led to the additional pads. Topic. Integration of space vehicle stack Months before launch, the three stages of the Saturn V launch vehicle and the components of the Apollo spacecraft were brought inside the Vehicle Assembly Building VAB, and assembled in one of four high bays into a 363-foot tall space vehicle on one of three mobile launches. Each mobile launcher consisted of a two-story, 161 by 135 foot, 49 by 41 meters launch platform with four hold-down arms and a 446 foot, 136 meters launch umbilical tower (LUT) topped by a crane used to lift the spacecraft into position for assembly. The MLP and unfueled vehicle together weighed 12,600,000 pounds 5 the umbilical tower contained two elevators and nine retractable swing arms which extended to the space vehicle, to provide access to each of the three rocket stages and the spacecraft for people, wiring and plumbing while the vehicle was on the launch pad, and swung away from the vehicle at launch. Technicians, engineers, and astronauts used the uppermost spacecraft access arm to access the crew cabin. At the end of the arm, the white room provided an environmentally controlled and protected area for astronauts and their equipment to enter the spacecraft. Topic. Transportation to the pad when the stack integration was completed, it was moved the 3 to 4 miles 4 .8 to, 6 .4 kilometers to the pad at a speed of 1 mile per hour, 1 .6 kilometers per hour by one of two crawler transporters. Each crawler weighed 6 million pounds 2, t and was capable of keeping the space vehicle on its mobile launcher level while negotiating a 5% grade to the pad. At the pad, the MLP was supported by six steel pedestals, plus four additional extensible columns. Topic. Mobile service structure After the MLP was set in place, the crawler transporter rolled a 410-foot pound mobile service structure MSS into place to provide further access for technicians to perform detailed checkout of the vehicle, and necessary umbilical connections to the pad. The MSS contained three elevators, two self-propelled platforms and three fixed platforms, and was rolled back 6,900 feet 2, meters to its parking position shortly before launch. Topic. Flame deflector A flame deflector was slid on rails into place under the launch pedestal. This system allowed for rotation with a second flame deflector, after the first was refurbished after each launch. Each deflector measured 39 feet 12 meters high by 49 feet 15 meters wide by 75 feet 23 meters long and weighed 1,400,000 pounds 635 t. It deflected the exhaust flame into a trench measuring 43 feet 13 meters deep by 59 feet 18 meters wide by 449 feet 137 meters long. Topic. Launch control and fueling 
The four-story launch control center was located 3.5 miles kilometers away from Pad A, adjacent to the vehicle assembly building for safety. The third floor had four firing rooms corresponding to the four high bays in the VAB, each with 470 sets of control and monitoring equipment. The second floor contained telemetry, tracking, instrumentation, and data reduction computing equipment. The LCC was connected to the mobile launchers by a high-speed data link, and during launch a system of 62 closed-circuit television cameras transmitted to 100 monitor screens in the LCC. Large cryogenic tanks located near the pad stored the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen for the second and third stages of the Saturn V. The highly explosive nature of these chemicals required numerous safety measures at the launch complex. The pads were located 8,730 feet 2,660 meters away from each other. Before tanking operations began and during launch, non-essential personnel were excluded from the danger area. <laughs> <laughs> Emergency evacuation system each pad had a 200-foot evacuation tube running from the mobile launcher platform to a blast-resistant bunker 39 feet 12 meters underground, equipped with survival supplies for 20 persons for 24 hours. There was also a capped slidewire system running from the 322-foot tower level to evacuate astronauts and technicians 2,503 feet 763 meters away from the pad. Topic. Pad terminal connection room Connections between the launch control center, mobile launcher platform and space vehicle are made in the pad terminal connection room The facility was a two-story series of rooms beneath the launch pad, constructed of reinforced concrete located on the west side of the flame trench and was protected by up to 20 feet meters of fill dirt. Topic. Apollo and Skylab launches The first use of LC-39 came in 1967 with the first Saturn V launch, carrying the unmanned Apollo 4 spacecraft. The second unmanned launch, Apollo 6, also used Pad 39A. With the exception of Apollo 10, which used Pad 39B due to the all-up Testing resulting in a two-month turnaround period, all manned Apollo Saturn V launches, commencing with Apollo 8, used Pad 39A. A total of 13 Saturn Vs were launched for Apollo, and the unmanned launch of the Skylab space station in 1973. The mobile launches were then modified for the shorter Saturn IB rockets, by adding a milk stool extension platform to the launch pedestal, so that the SIVB upper stage and Apollo spacecraft swing arms would reach. These were used for three man Skylab flights and the Apollo Soyuz test project, since the Saturn IB pads 34 and 37 at Cape Canaveral AFB had been decommissioned. <laughs> <laughs> Space Shuttle The thrust to allow the Space Shuttle to achieve orbit was provided by a combination of the Solid Rocket Boosters SRBs and the Space Shuttle Main Engines SSMEs. The SRBs used solid propellant, hence their name. The SSMEs used a combination of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen from the external tank ET. as the orbiter did not have internal fuel tanks for the SSMEs they would have had to be as large as the external tank. The SRBs arrived in segments via rail car from their manufacturing facility in Utah, the external tank arrived from its manufacturing facility in Louisiana by barge, and the orbiter waited in the Orbiter Processing Facility OPF. The SRBs were first stacked in the VAB, and then the external tank was mounted between them. Then, using a massive crane, the orbiter was lowered and connected to the external tank. Payload to be installed at the launch pad was independently transported in a payload transportation canister then installed vertically at the payload change-out room. Otherwise, payloads would have already been pre-installed at the orbiter processing facility and transported within the orbiter's cargo bay. The original structure of the pads was remodeled for the needs of the Space Shuttle, starting with Pad 39A after the last Saturn V launch, and in 1977 for Pad 39B after the Apollo-Soyuz test project in 1975. 
Topic: <laughs> Launch towers. Each pad contained a two-piece access tower system, the fixed service structure FSS and the rotating service structure RSS. The FSS permitted access to the shuttle via a retractable arm and a beanie cap to capture vented locks from the external tank. The RSS contained the payload changeout room, which offered clean access to the orbiter's payload bay, protection from the elements, and protection in winds up to 60 knots the FSS on Pad 39A was constructed from most of the umbilical tower of Mobile Launcher 2, while the FSS that was on 39B was constructed from most of the umbilical tower of Mobile Launcher 3. Topic: <laughs> Sound suppression water system. A sound suppression water system SSWS, was added to protect the Space Shuttle and its payload from effects of the intense sound wave pressure generated by its engines. An elevated water tank on a 290-foot tower near each pad stored 300,000 U.S. gallons 1 liters of water, which was released onto the mobile launcher platform just before engine ignition. The water muffled the intense sound waves produced by the engines. Due to heating of the water, a large quantity of steam and water vapor was produced during launch. Topic. Swing arm modifications The gaseous oxygen vent arm positioned a hood, often called the beanie cap, over the top of the external tank ET nose cone during fueling. Heated gaseous nitrogen was used there to remove the extremely cold gaseous oxygen that normally vented out of the external tank. This prevented the formation of ice that could fall and damage the shuttle. The hydrogen vent line access arm made at the external tank ET ground umbilical carrier plate GUCP, to the launch pad hydrogen vent line. The GUCP provided support for plumbing and cables, called umbilicals, that transferred fluids, gases, and electrical signals between two pieces of equipment. While the ET was being fueled, hazardous gas was vented from an internal hydrogen tank through the GUCP, out of vent line to a flare stack where it was burned off at a safe distance. Sensors at the GUCP measured gas level. The GUCP was redesigned after leaks created scrubs of STS-127 and were also detected during attempts to launch STS-119 and STS-133. The GUCP released from the ET at launch and fell away with a curtain of water sprayed across it for protection from flames. Topic. Emergency pad evacuation In an emergency, the launch complex used a slidewire escape basket system for quick evacuation. Assisted by members of the closeout team, the crew would leave the orbiter and ride an emergency basket to the ground at speeds reaching up to 55 miles per hour, 89 kilometers per hour. From there, the crew took shelter in a bunker. A modified M113 armored personnel carrier could carry injured astronauts away from the complex to safety. During the launch of Discovery on STS-124 on May 31, 2008, the pad at LC-39A suffered extensive damage, in particular to the concrete trench used to deflect the SRB's flames. A subsequent mishap investigation found that the damage was the result of carbonation of epoxy and corrosion of steel anchors, which held the refractory bricks in the trench in place. These had been exacerbated by the fact that hydrochloric acid is an exhaust byproduct of the solid rocket boosters. Topic: Space Shuttle launches. After the launch of Skylab in 1973, Pad 39A was reconfigured for the Space Shuttle, with shuttle launches beginning in 1981 with STS-1, flown by the Space Shuttle Columbia. After Apollo 10, Pad 39B was kept as a backup launch facility in the case of the destruction of 39A, but saw service for all three Skylab missions, the Apollo-Soyuz test flight, and a contingency Skylab rescue flight that never became necessary. 
After the Apollo Soyuz test project, 39B was reconfigured similarly to 39A, but due to additional modifications, mainly to allow the facility to serve as a modified Centaur G upper stage, along with budgetary restraints, it was not ready until 1986, and the first shuttle flight to use it was STS 51L, which ended with the Challenger disaster. The first return to flight mission STS 26 launched from 39B. Topic. Constellation program and Pad 39B The last shuttle launch from Pad 39B was the nighttime launch of STS-116 on December 9, 2006. To support the final shuttle mission to the Hubble Space Telescope STS-125 launched from Pad 39A in May 2009, Endeavour was placed on 39B if needed to launch the STS-400 rescue mission. After the completion of STS-125, 39B was converted for the single test flight of the Constellation program Ares IX from Pad 39B on October 28, 2009. This program was later cancelled. Topic: 2011 to 2013. With the retirement of the shuttle in 2011, and the cancellation of Constellation program in 2010, the future of the LC-39 pads was uncertain. By early 2011, NASA began informal discussions on use of the pads and facilities by private companies to fly missions for the commercial space market, culminating in a 20-year lease agreement with SpaceX for Pad 39A. Topic: 2012 to 2014. Just like the first 24 shuttle flights, Pad 39A supported the final shuttle flights, starting with STS-117 in June 2007 until the retirement of the shuttle fleet in July 2011. Prior to the SpaceX lease agreement, the pad remained as it was when Atlantis launched on the final shuttle mission on July 8, 2011, complete with a mobile launcher platform. Talks for use of the pad were underway between NASA and Space Florida the state of Florida's Economic Development Agency, as early as 2011, but no deal materialized by 2012 and NASA then pursued other options for removing the pad from the federal government inventory. By early 2013, NASA publicly announced that it would allow commercial launch providers to lease pad 39A, and followed that, in May 2013, with a formal solicitation for proposals for commercial use of launch pad 39A. There were two competing bids for the commercial use of the launch complex. SpaceX submitted a bid for exclusive use of the launch complex, while Jeff Bezos Blue Origin submitted a bid for shared non-exclusive use of the complex such that the launch pad would interface with multiple vehicles, and costs could be shared over the long term. One potential shared user in the Blue Origin plan was United Launch Alliance. Prior to completion of the bid period, and prior to any public announcement by NASA of the results of the process, Blue Origin filed a protest with the U.S. General Accounting Office GAL, over what it says is a plan by NASA to award an exclusive commercial lease to SpaceX for use of mothballed Space Shuttle Launch Pad 39A. NASA had planned to complete the bid award and have the pad transferred by October 1, 2013, but the protest will delay any decision until the GAO reaches a decision, expected by mid-December." On December 12, 2013, the GAO denied the protest and sided with NASA, which argued that the solicitation contains no preference on the use of the facility as multi-use or single-use. The solicitation document merely asks bidders to explain their reasons for selecting one approach instead of the other and how they would manage the facility. On December 13, 2013, NASA announced that it selected SpaceX as the new commercial tenant. SpaceX signed the lease agreement on April 14, 2014. SpaceX was given a 20-year exclusive lease of Pad 39A. SpaceX plans to launch their Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy from the pad and build a new hangar near it. Elon Musk, CEO of SpaceX, stated that he wanted to shift most of their NASA launches to Pad 39A, including commercial cargo and crew missions to the International Space Station. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Launch history. Topic: 
Pad 39A launches. Topic: Pad 39B launches. Topic: Current status. Topic: Launch Pad 39A. On April 14, 2014, the privately owned launch service provider SpaceX signed a 20-year lease for Launch Pad 39A. The pad was modified to support launches of both Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launch vehicles, which included the construction of a horizontal integration facility, similar to that used at existing SpaceX leased facilities at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and Vandenberg Air Force Base. This is a marked difference from the vertical integration process used by NASA's own Apollo and Space Shuttle vehicles at the Launch Complex 39. Additionally new instrumentation and control systems were installed, and substantial new plumbing was added for a variety of rocket liquids and gases. Construction and first launch in 2015, SpaceX built a large horizontal integration facility HIF, just outside the perimeter of the existing launch pad in order to house both the Falcon 9, and the Falcon Heavy, rockets, and their associated hardware and payloads, during preparation for flight. Both types of launch vehicles will be transported from the HIF to the launch pad aboard a transporter erector which will ride on rails up the former crawlerway path. Also in 2015, the launch mount for the Falcon Heavy was constructed on Pad 39A over the existing infrastructure. The work on both the HIF building, and the pad, was substantially complete by late 2015. A rollout test of the new transporter, Erector Tay, was conducted in November 2015. SpaceX indicated in February 2016 that they had completed and activated Launch Complex 39A but still has more work yet to do to support crewed flights. SpaceX originally planned to be ready to accomplish the first launch at Pad 39A, a Falcon Heavy, as early as 2015, as they had architects and engineers working on the new design and modifications since 2013. By late 2014, a preliminary date for a wet dress rehearsal of the Falcon Heavy was set for no earlier than July 1, 2015. Due to a failure in a June 2015 Falcon 9 launch, SpaceX had to delay launching the Falcon Heavy in order to focus on the Falcon 9's failure investigation and its return to flight. In early 2016, considering the busy Falcon 9 launch manifest, it became unclear if Falcon Heavy would be the first vehicle to launch from Pad 39A, or if one or more Falcon 9 missions would precede a Falcon Heavy launch. The following months, the Falcon Heavy launch was delayed multiple times and eventually pushed back to February 2018. The first SpaceX launch from Pad 39A was SpaceX CRS-10 using a Falcon 9 on February 19, 2017. It was the company's 10th cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station and the first unmanned launch from 39A since Skylab. Topic SpaceX launch history While SLC-40 was undergoing reconstruction after the loss of the Amos-6 satellite on September 1, 2016, all SpaceX's East Coast launches were launched from LC-39A until SLC-40 became operational again in December 2017. These included the May 1, 2017 launch of NROL-76, the first SpaceX mission for the National Reconnaissance Office with a classified payload. On February 6, 2018, LC-39A hosted the successful liftoff of the Falcon Heavy on its maiden launch, carrying Elon Musk's Tesla Roadster car to space, and the first flight of the human-rated spacecraft Crew Dragon took place there on March 2, 2019. The second Falcon Heavy flight, carrying the Arabsat 6A communications satellite for Arabsat of Saudi Arabia, successfully launched on April 11, 2019. The satellite is to provide Ku band and Ka band communication services over the Middle East and Northern Africa regions, as well as a small bit for South Africa. The launch was notable as it marked the first time that SpaceX was able to successfully soft land all three of the reusable booster stages, which will be refurbished for future launches. 
Topic: Notable future flights. As of March 2019, future notable missions include a second Dragon 2 mission, Demonstration Mission 2 minus two German marks, scheduled for June 2019, will launch the first crewed mission from LC-39A and the United States since STS-135. The third flight of the Falcon Heavy is set to launch from this pad carrying the U.S. Air Force's Space Test Program 2 (STP-2) with a cluster of military and scientific research satellites. Launch date to be determined. Topic. Capabilities SpaceX utilizes the former fixed service structure FSS of the Pad 39A launch towers, and intends to extend it above its former 350-foot height, but did not need the rotating service structure RSS, and removed it beginning in February 2016. NASA removed the orbiter servicing arm, with intent to use the space later to build a museum, and white room by which astronauts entered the Space Shuttle. SpaceX indicated in late 2014 that additional levels to the FSS would not be added in the near term. SpaceX planned to subsequently add at least two additional levels to the FSS, and will utilize the FSS for providing crew access for the Dragon V2 launches. SpaceX assembles its launch vehicles horizontally in a hangar near the pad, and transports to the pad horizontally before erecting the vehicle to vertical for the launch. For military missions from Pad 39A, payloads will be vertically integrated, as that is required per launch contract with the U.S. Air Force. A hammerhead crane is planned to be added to the FSS in order to support U.S. military requirements for vertical payload integration. Pad 39A will be used to host launches of astronauts on the crewed version of the Dragon space capsule in a public-private partnership with NASA. The NASA plan as of April 2014 called for the first NASA crewed missions in 2017. SpaceX intends to add a crew gantry access arm and white room to allow for crew and cargo ingress to the vehicle. The existing Space Shuttle evacuation slide wire basket system will also be repurposed to provide a safe emergency egress for the Dragon crew in the event of an emergency on the pad that does not necessitate using the Crew Dragon's launch abort system. In August 2018, SpaceX's Crew Access Arm CAA, was installed on a new level which was built at the necessary height to enter the Crew Dragon spacecraft atop a Falcon 9 rocket. The next month, in September 2018, the refurbished Space Shuttle Emergency Egress System was raised to this new level. <laughs> <laughs> Launch Pad 39B Since the Ares IX flight, NASA proceeded with plans to strip Pad 39B of its flight service structure FSS, returning the location to an Apollo-like, clean pad. Designed for the first time since 1977. This approach will make the pad available to multiple types of vehicles which arrive at the pad with service structures on the mobile launcher platform as opposed to custom structures on the pad. The LH-2, LOX, and water tanks used for the sound suppression system are the only structures left from the Space Shuttle era. As of June 2012, repairs and modifications to selected facility systems at Launch Complex LC 39B for Space Launch System SLS processing and launch operations are finishing the first phase of a five-phase project. The second phase of this project is currently budgeted at $89.2 million, $6.1 million in FY 2012, $28.5 million in FY 2013, $9.4 million in FY 2014 and $45.2 million in the out years. In March 2015, Pad 39B was undergoing modifications to the catacomb roof structure so that it can handle the loads from the SLS Block 1B rocket, increasing the load capacity to support the crawler transporter and vertical rocket from 21 million to 25 million 500,000 pounds, 9 million 500,000 to 11 million 600,000 kilograms. In 2014, NASA announced that it would make Pad 39B available to commercial users during times when it is not needed by the Space Launch System. Topic. Launch Pad 39C Launch Pad 39C is a new facility for smaller launch vehicles built in 2015 within the Launch Complex 39B perimeter. 
Topic: Construction. Construction of the pad began in January 2015 and was completed in June 2015. Kennedy Space Center Director Robert D. Cabana and representatives from the Ground Systems Development and Operations GSDO program and the Center Planning and Development CPD and Engineering Directorates marked the completion of the new pad during a ribbon-cutting ceremony July 17, 2015. As America's premier spaceport, we're always looking for new and innovative ways to meet America's launch needs, and one area that was missing was small class payloads. Robert D. Cabana said, "...using 21st century funds, we built Pad 39C." GSDO oversaw the project and is working with CPD to grow commercial space efforts at Kennedy. "...Pad 39C is the latest addition to our portfolio of launch pads," said Scott Colorado, CPD director. "...The small class market is here. The demand for that kind of launcher is increasing." The key here is this is really what a launch site for a small class launcher needs to look like. The concrete pad measures about 50 feet 15 meters wide by about 100 feet 30 meters long and could support the combined weight of a fueled launch vehicle, payload and customer provided launch mount up to about 132,000 pounds 60,000 kilograms, and an umbilical tower structure, fluid lines, cables and umbilical arms weighing up to about 47,000 pounds 21,000 kilograms. GSDO also developed a universal propellant servicing system to provide liquid oxygen and liquid methane fueling capabilities for a variety of small class rockets. This is absolutely great to designate a new pad within the confines of Pad 39B. I'm looking forward to having customers here in the not too distant future, making use of this outstanding facility." Robert D. Cabana said. Topic. Capabilities KSC's newest launch pad, designated 39C, is designed to accommodate small class vehicles. Located in the southeast area of the launch complex 39B perimeter, this new concrete pad measures about 50 feet 15 meters wide by about 100 feet 30 meters long. Launch Complex 39C will serve as a multi-purpose site allowing companies to test vehicles and capabilities in the smaller class of rockets, making it more affordable for smaller companies to break into the commercial space flight market. As part of this capability, NASA's Ground Systems Development and Operations Program developed a universal propellant servicing system, which can provide liquid oxygen and liquid methane fueling capabilities for a variety of small class rockets. This system is slated for operational readiness in the summer of 2016. With the addition of Launch Complex 39C, KSC can offer the following processing and launching features for companies working with small class vehicles maximum thrust up to 200,000 pounds force, 890 kN, processing facilities, i.e., vehicle assembly building, Vehicle payload transportation KAMAG, flatbed trucks, tugs, etc. from integration facility to pad. Launch site Universal Propellant Servicing System LOX, LCH4 Launch Control Center, Mobile Command Center options Topic. Future development Kennedy Space Center KSC, previous master plan recommendations in 1966, 1972, and 1977 noted that an expansion of KSC's vertical launch capacity could occur when the market demand existed. The 2007 site evaluation study recommended an additional vertical launch pad, Launch Complex 49 LC49, to be sited to the north of existing LC39B. As part of the Environmental Impact Study EYES process, this area was consolidated from two pads, formally designated in 1963 plans as 39C and 39D, to one that provides greater separation from LC-39B. The area was expanded to accommodate a wider variety of launch azimuths, helping protect against potential overflight concerns of LC-39B. 
This LC-49 launch facility could accommodate medium to large class launch vehicles. The 2007 vertical launch site evaluation study concluded that a vertical launch pad could also be sited to the south of 39A and to the north of Pad 41 to accommodate small, medium launch vehicles. Designated as Launch Complex 48 LC48, this area is best suited to accommodate small to medium class launch vehicles due to its closer proximity to LC39A and LC41. Due to the nature of these activities, QD arcs, launch hazard impact limit lines, other safety setbacks, and exposure limits requirements will be imposed for safe operations. The proposed launch pads were published in the Kennedy Space Center Master Plan in 2012. The master plan also notes a new vertical launch pad northwest of LC-39B and a horizontal launch area north of the LC-49 and converting the shuttle landing facility SLF and at apron areas into its second horizontal launch area. Space Florida has proposed that Launch Complex 48 be developed for use by Boeing's Phantom Express and that three landing pads be built for reusable booster systems to provide more landing options for SpaceX's Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, Blue Origin's New Glenn and other potential reusable vehicles. The pads would be located east of the horizontal launch area and north of LC-39B. Those plans are not in line with NASA's KSC master plan. Topic. Gallery Topic. See also Kennedy Space Center List of Cape Canaveral and Merritt Island launch sites